Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we'll be examining the idea of moral obligations and the problem it creates for secular ethical theories. We're following the argument made by George Mavrot in his The Queerness of Morality. This is also the last of the religious ethics lectures and one which will explain the third benefit of religious ethics as noted in the previous lecture. Our presentation is going to take the Mavrod's argument out of order a bit for ease of demonstration. We begin with the core issue, moral obligations. A moral obligation is the duty imposed on all people to do some action, X, or to refrain from doing some action, Y. Failure to carry out that duty is seen as morally reprehensible. Mavroj notes that failing in one's moral obligations, and thus being understood as morally reprehensible, has social and legal consequences. That is, we do not merely treat these obligations as nice ideas, we treat them as actually binding limits to human behavior. Now, when we speak of duty here, we're not doing so in a deontic way. This is not about the Kantian reading of morality. Instead, take any idea with moral value, like do not kidnap, rape, and murder infants. Mavro's idea of moral obligation means that we are all, every single one of us, under a duty to not engage in those behaviors. So the moral obligation is really something like whatever the core values of an ethical system happen to be, and whatever they are, they must be absolute. Well, why? Because if they are not, then you don't actually have any rules, and so you don't have an ethical theory. What you have is pure chaos of preference. These obligations are absolute in that your preference is irrelevant. We don't waive the don't kidnap, rape, and murder obligation if you happen to feel like kidnapping, rape, and murder. Your feelings are inherently irrelevant. The cost attached to these obligations is equally irrelevant. Whether you feel like doing them, or you dislike them, or you will lose your legs, or you will die, the moral obligations have the exact same demands. Those consequences are just part of your feelings on the matter, and feelings don't matter. And this is true for utilitarianism as well, because the right thing to do may require sacrifice of the few for the many. If you happen to be part of a few to be sacrificed, it would be wrong of you to try to avoid that sacrifice or to fight against it from a utilitarian perspective. Okay, so now we have this idea of absolutely universally binding obligations to do and not do certain acts, and if we fail to act accordingly, the consequences are certainly going to be real. That's the issue at play. Next, Mavroj wants to draw a clear line of distinction between secular and non-secular ethics. So, he uses the definition of a secular world as offered by Bertrand Russell, a great intellectual and philosopher on the atheist secular side. This move, by the way, is something you should learn to emulate. Mavroj ensures that he can't be accused of misrepresenting the secular side by borrowing the definition straight from a major thinker on that other side of the argument. In doing so, he also provides us with a full and clear definition of the kinds of ideas that he will be taking on. So, the secular world, which Mavroch calls the Russellian world, is as follows. Point one, the world is purely secular and material. Point two, all the benefits and losses that a human can experience must take place in that physical world. That is, there is no benefit or loss that is in any way not calculable in some material way. And that includes your sense of pleasure and pain as well, since it is your physical body and physical brain that give you those experiences. And point three, death is the end of any benefits or losses. In fact, the moment of your death is, in every relevant way, exactly the same to you as the complete end of the universe. And that's because when you die, everything ceases to exist from your perspective. And so, it makes no difference if you die alone or if the universe poofs out of existence when you do. The end result is the same. Now, this setup gives us one initial problem. Everything in the universe is just a pile of atoms, or if you prefer, a pile of quarks. How does a pile of quarks have a moral obligation? How is a pile of quarks morally responsible or morally reprehensible? Why does this only apply to humans, if we too are nothing more than a pile of quarks? 
Why can't rocks have moral obligations? The second problem is how morality in such a world is supposed to make sense. So Mavrodes lays out the secular argument for why it is in our best interest to be moral. In essence, it is the argument that tackles the issue of justice and injustice in the Republic. And the conclusion of that argument is that, quote, it is in everyone's best interest, including mine, that everyone, including me, be moral. But this argument doesn't actually work, and specifically, it doesn't work for the exact same reason that Glaucon gave us in the Republic. It is actually my best interest if everyone is moral, and everyone acts justly, except me. And that way, I do not fear suffering injustice, but I get the disproportionate benefits of doing injustice. Let's use an example. Car insurance works as follows. A lot of people pay monthly premiums. That's the money coming into a collective pool. The premium that you pay is lower than the cost of repairing the car, and that's why you bother with insurance. But only a few people actually get into accidents and draw money from that pool. So the input of money is greater than the output of money, and that's how the system operates. Now, in a Rossellian world, it is a loss to have to pay for car insurance. And that's because the cost is very real and material. I exchange money, which is hours of my life spent working, for that service. If I could have that service but not pay for it, I would be better off materially. But if everyone did that, then the pool of money would drain. And then when I needed the service, I would not be able to get it. So I would actually be worse off. So it is in my interest that everyone pays for their car insurance. But I am still better off if I don't pay it. So the ideal version of things is that everyone else should pay the premiums and I should find a way of cheating. And that way, the pool is still big enough to cover me if I need it, but I also get to keep my own money. So it is in my best interest if everyone is moral and acts justly, except for me. The issue here, as Mavrox points out, is that there is no way out of this argument in a Rossellian world. And that sets the stage for the big issue, moral obligations. Moral obligations have a cost. The cost is material. It requires time, effort, resources, life, and so on. Now, in a Rossellian world, paying a cost only ever makes sense if your returns are equal to or greater than the cost. That is, making that payment is rational, but only if your benefit can either break even or get you back more than what you paid. All benefits and losses must be accounted for materially. Acting morally has a cost, so that's a negative Rossellian value. So if that behavior is to be rational, the outcome must produce positive consequences that are at least as big as the cost or better. If the costs are greater than your returns, than the benefits that you get out of that behavior, then the act is not a good act, it is a miscalculated act. That is, you made a mistake in your projections and made a mistake by doing something whose cost is greater than the benefit. This is all again perfectly rational and reasonable in a Rossellian world. So we get the question, is it reasonable to carry out your moral obligation if it conflicts with your personal welfare? That is, is it reasonable to do things where your cost is greater than your benefit? And the Rossellian answer can only be a resounding no. It is only rational to carry out your moral obligations if the cost of those obligations is lower than the benefit you're getting. And right there, you should start seeing the problem. Moral obligations are supposed to be absolute, and we just made them contingent on whether you like the outcome. That is, you're only obligated to do things you feel like doing. Doesn't sound like morality. But it gets worse. Serious obligations have a cost component which is inherently greater than the resulting benefits for you in the material Rossellian sense. From a Rossellian perspective, carrying out such actions is stupid, it's illogical, it's incoherent. These actions can only be done as a mistake, never intentionally. And this really comes to the fore when we look at things like your ultimate obligations. So let's use an example of soldiers. Soldiers are asked to risk their lives for their country and some pay. In times of peace, being a soldier has social benefits and very little risk, so that's a net Rossellian positive. But take the example of soldiers facing overwhelming odds. 
Maybe they're surrounded. Maybe the enemy is dug in. Maybe it's D-Day on Omaha Beach and they're on the first boat headed to shore. Soldiers still have a moral obligation to follow orders they are given, no matter the cost of carrying them out. And they have a moral obligation to not desert or switch sides, no matter the odds against them. A soldier who runs away will be prosecuted and often executed for desertion. A soldier who switches sides, even though there is no chance for his side to win, and there is no chance of survival otherwise, will still be tried as a traitor and executed. And this is because soldiers have this moral obligation to do their job, no matter the personal cost of themselves. To carry out such moral obligations means to give up all benefits forever, because you are going to your death. And the real trick is, if you do not go to your death, then you are morally reprehensible and will be persecuted and prosecuted. That position is entirely incoherent in a Russellian world. Now, you may be thinking, well, what's wrong with having an irrational obligation? An obligation, by definition, cannot be irrational. It's either rational or it is not an obligation. You see, you need to have a reason why you should do something in order to do it. If your reason why makes no sense, then it is not a thing that you should do. And this absence of reason comes as part of the core definition of the secular world. So, to recap, the problem with secular ethics and moral obligations is that secular system requires that all your benefits and losses be material. And so, the only actions that are coherent are those where material losses are smaller than your material benefits gained through these losses. This makes moral behavior an investment. Give up something of value now for a greater return of things you value later. But situations where moral obligation requires that something of value be given up without the ability to recoup that cost, so you can't get the benefits out, cannot be supported by the secular system because it is a bad investment. That is, secular ethics allows for investment but not for sacrifice. And sacrifice here is used in the sense of giving up something of value without a material world. And this makes no sense. It is incoherent because the value lost cannot be recuperated. Because the Rossellian world is purely material, and because the only benefits and losses have to happen materially, any moral obligation where the material cost cannot be redeemed by later benefits cannot be obligations, not coherently anyway. Because morality always requires paying a cost, and moral obligations tend to require significant costs, specifically of the kind that you cannot recoup, morality only makes sense in the Rossellian world so long as it is working to your material benefit. In that same world, moral obligations can never make sense, because those are supposed to be obligations regardless of outcomes. A simplified way of putting it is something like this. Because the Rossellian world can only support actions that are to your own benefit, the Rossellian world cannot actually have morality. It can only ever have preference. And therefore, it cannot have coherent moral obligations. Now, there are a few loose ends to tie up here. You may be thinking, but if you get caught not fulfilling your moral obligations, then the cost could be just as bad or worse. And there are two problems with this argument. One, it doesn't make the moral obligations point coherent. To put it in terms of Plato's Republic, it still doesn't prove that you should be just, only that you should be better at injustice. And point two, the threat of getting caught is about perception and power. If you're skilled enough to not get caught, does that make your behavior morally good? If you're strong enough to resist punishment, does that make your acts okay? For example, is the kidnap, rape, and murder of infants fine if you can get away with it, or if you're a crazy strong dictator who doesn't have to worry about punishment? You see, that line of argument doesn't give you morality. It only establishes that might makes right, which is the ultimate anti-morality position. You also may be thinking, what about arguments like morality is an evolutionary trait? Doesn't that mean that it's good for us? And because evolutionary theory is secular, it works in a secular world. Two more problems here. Problem one, the fact that you have an evolutionary feature says nothing about whether the feature is something that you should use rationally. You have an appendix, and that seems to serve no purpose. You have wisdom teeth that you have most likely removed. So what? 
the evolutionary argument might hold if we were limited by evolution. But because we have reason and opposable thumbs, we are no longer bound by that system. Do you have any idea how many children are born each year with conditions that should kill them? But we got around that evolutionary problem. We have medicine, uh, surgery, reconstructive techniques. We can rebuild them. The same evolutionary argument would prevent gay and lesbian individuals and couples from having biologically related children. And the same goes for people who have trouble conceiving for any reason. And yet we found ways to essentially negate that evolutionary block. We are outside of the evolutionary restrictions. Thus, even if evolutionary theory could explain morality sufficiently, and I'm not sure that it can, it would do nothing to indicate that we have moral obligations. Second, the evolutionary theory applies to groups, not individuals. So it would still be an advantage for me to be immoral and get away with it, while the rest of you remained moral. In fact, it would be best if you all thought I was moral while I was not. And this is exactly the problem that's noted by Mavroge and by Glaucon. I am under no actual moral obligation to do anything not in my personal immediate interest. Finally, you might be thinking, look, so long as we feel that there is an obligation, that's good enough. That's why we have laws against kidnapping, rape, and murder of infants. We can just do it by law. We don't need morality. And again, this isn't going to work, because you need a basis for having laws. Why should kidnap, rape, and murder of infants be bad? Who decided on that? What are you basing it on? And you better not say social agreement, since social agreement told us that it was okay to kidnap, enslave, torture, and rape Africans for about 400 years in this country. Also, Mongolian destructions of like a quarter of the globe, Nazis, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and so on, all had popular support. You really want to argue that that's okay? So you need to have a coherent basis for your laws, and that basis comes from ethics. What about people who can evade the law, or are above the law? Is it now okay for them to do these things? Finally, having a feeling is ultimately relevant. The person who commits atrocities had a feeling that it was okay to do that. Unless there is a rational reason for behaving as moral obligations require, everyone who believes in moral obligations is just wrong. The same way that people who think that 2 plus 2 is 5 are wrong. And this all leaves us in a really ugly place. In a Russellian world, morality is nothing more than preferences. And you have no basis for deciding that your preferences are better than mine. No way of enforcing your preferences except by brute force. And in that case, we're right back to the whole might makes right issue. Okay, fine, so there is no secular morality. How is religious morality supposed to solve that? Religious morality has a different understanding of the world, and of course it does because the axiomatic difference in understanding reality means a completely different interpretation of the world. So let's build that up. Point one, the world is material, but human beings, and possibly other beings, also have an immaterial component. Two, the immaterial component, the you, survives the material death. Three, the world has a purpose, telos, which is the basis of performance evaluation for your actions. Four, the performance evaluation is carried out on the basis of truth of your intent and actions, not of perception of those factors by others. Five, some benefits and losses can be experienced in the material world, but the only real benefits and losses are assigned after death. That is, the actual benefits and losses that humans experience do not take place in the material world, but in the immaterial afterlife. And six, therefore, death is not the end of benefits and losses, but the beginning. The world does not end with your death, and you are certainly around after that material death. So you should see that this layout gives you the basis for moral obligation in the telos of the world and of humans. But more importantly, the idea of benefits and loss are moved to a point after the material death, and then they're assigned on the basis of truth, which cannot be rigged. Notice that this system does something that no secular system can. It takes the idea of secular sacrifice, a loss that cannot be recovered, and turns it instead into an investment, a momentary material loss 
which is turned into benefit in the future. And this is only possible when the future component is not limited by death. So now the idea of moral obligations makes sense because that massive loss in the material world is not really a loss and it's not permanent. You actually use it as a massive investment which is eventually paid out with absolute certainty. And then the idea of getting away with immoral behavior is also impossible because the system does a performance analysis based on truth instead of perception. So you can't hide your crimes. And because the judgment and enforcement is carried out by an absolute authority, no amount of worldly power will allow you to be above the moral law. So now when we say that somebody has a moral obligation, we can coherently mean something like an absolute responsibility to do or not do some set of acts, where the failure to carry out that responsibility makes you morally reprehensible and subject to prosecution. All of which applies whether you agree or disagree with the obligations, whether or not you like or dislike those obligations, and regardless of the costs of fulfilling those obligations. If you think back to our last lecture, we noted that the religious ethics are universal in a way that secular ethics cannot be. And this is the reason why. Secular ethics by Kant, Mill, Aristotle, Rawls, Ross, feminists, etc., they all have an axiomatic set of features that are stuck in the Russellian world by design. Consequently, the best they can say is that if you believed in their axioms, then you should behave according to their theory. But even that pitch only goes as far as the question posed in the Republic. Why should I restrict my behavior to some set of rules when I can be better off by breaking those rules? And there are a lot of answers that are offered here, but none are particularly compelling. In fact, they generally boil down to a threat of force if you don't comply, which just means I have to be good at hiding my behavior or be strong enough to not care. Another way to boil it down is claims of being better off, which are really incoherent since I'm always better off being immoral while the rest of you are moral. Or finally, the idea of creating a better world, which is again incoherent. Why should I care how the world is for you? I care how it is for me. And to make it best for me, I want the benefit and not the costs. The rest of you can go die in a fire. And when I die, my experience is exactly the same as if the universe ended and all of you died too. So I don't care about the world I leave behind. Since I can play no part of that world, any praises people sing of me after I'm gone are irrelevant. Hero or villain, my death is the end of any benefit I can possibly have. Mavroge is not alone in this argument. Well, at least in the denial of the possibility of ethics with the assumption of a secular universe. Ever since roughly Darwin, this argument has been the leading position in philosophy. Sure, we write articles and books about how Kantian ethics this and utilitarian ethics that, but all of it is ultimately based on nothing. There is no basis at all for ethics in a secular world. All there is is preferences and force. But your skill at hiding your actions and power to resist force means that you are morally free to do as you please since there won't be any actual consequences for you. Religious ethics ensure that there are consequences. And it doesn't matter which religion you choose. And it doesn't even matter if all religions are wrong. If you accept the axioms of religious ethics, the idea of morality makes sense. That is, there is a rational and coherent reason to moral behavior. There is a coherence to moral obligations. Since you have to accept any ethical theory by assuming its axioms, the religious option at least makes sense of the idea of moral obligations, and it doesn't devolve into a might-makes-right position, or worse, incompetent appeals to features that cannot possibly have any effect on me. Now that concludes our series on religious ethics. I hope that you've been able to make some sense of it all. Some of you might be feeling more religious, others might be feeling more nihilistic. Either way, I hope that whatever your position, you have it rationally. Make sure that your understanding of the position and justification for that position and the implications of that position are solid and make sense. I also hope that you don't simply continue talking about, quote, being a good person, as if that means something outside the limits of a particular ethical theory, or that you keep on talking about the law 
as if it is somehow independent of core moral values. If you have questions or comments, feel free to leave it in the comment section below or email me. Thank you.